we crave the apocalypse. Post-apocalyptic stories saturate the world right now. Stories about barren wastelands and the fallout of nuclear war, stories about tribal civilization reinventing itself in the ashes of human ambition, stories of reclamation in spite of great evils, stories of hopelessness in the face of ambivalent leaders and devastating destruction. We love fantasizing about our own death, fantasizing about being lone survivors, fantasizing about rebuilding a community in spite of impossible odds, and fantasizing about being a people worth rebuilding in the first place. We cannot stop making books, movies, games about the end of the world, the death of human civilization as we know it. We crave this sensation, the idea of dying out being reduced to a flickering ember of what was once a roaring flame. We have built a world so horrible that we dream of obliterating it. Deep down, we know we deserve it. We know that everything that happens to humanity at the end of the world was earned. And when the earth starts scorching us all to death, we'll have earned that too. We'll have built our demise because at least it was worth all of the coal and oil and gas. It was worth burning up the atmosphere and poisoning the water because at least we have Funko Pops and Stanley Cups. We all want to die and we participate in our suicide every single day. Our obsession with the apocalypse isn't one of pure self-loathing, though. It is also an implicit act of faith in the human spirit. All of these stories involve humanity rebuilding itself. There is something deserving of admiration in the indomitable human spirit. Horizon Zero Dawn's humanity has destroyed itself, but has also planted the seeds for humanity to start over. The Walking Dead and The Last of Us showcase our will to survive, where Fallout and Death Stranding embody the drive to recover what we have lost. We may deserve the end of the world, but perhaps we also deserve a chance to start over. Admittedly, part of the appeal is also the destruction of modern tedium. Nobody has to work an office job in Horizon Zero Dawn. It's also appealing that the supremely powerful governments that rule our world are reduced to ashes. Shitty new ones usually rise up, but at least it's a chance to start over. It sounds kind of nice to shrug off the current hopeless problems our world faces in favor of new ones. It's appealing to see our corrupt leaders getting what they deserve and the relatively simple problem of raw survival rising from the dust. At least I am responsible for my own survival. It may be equally hopeless, I'm not the survivalist type, but at least I have direct control over whether my life continues or not. But I am powerless to remove two old bickering hags who are stumbling over each other to become president. I am powerless to put an end to the genocide in Palestine. I am a powerless citizen in a country where the popular vote is secondary, and that country claims to have my interests at heart but my existence is worth less to them than the grave I will ultimately occupy. Fallout 4 surprised me in many ways. First, by being a Bethesda game I actually enjoy, and second, through its story. On my playthrough, I sided with the Minutemen. Without spoiling anything, I couldn't align myself with the Institute. I spent a lot of time learning to live in the Commonwealth, and despite all of its evils, the human spirit in its rawest form saturates this dry dirt. The Institute is a remnant of the old world, of the world that brought us this destruction, 
it is an embodiment of the elitism that landed us in the fallout to begin with. I was surprised at how profoundly fond of the wasteland I was. I firmly believed that humanity's best and only hope was to fight for survival the way we always have, rather than follow a cold, calculated, and statistically viable path. And even if we fail, even if the commonwealth destroys itself, I'd still rather take that chance above anything else. Despite the cruelty of the wasteland, there is enough good that I was not willing to give up our way of life. Post-apocalyptic stories often revolve around the cruelty of humanity. It's an interesting exercise in imagining what our state of nature is, and honestly these depictions are probably more accurate quote unquote, than anything John Locke or Hobbes thought up. Despite the criticism it's faced lately, I do genuinely think that The Last of Us is an excellent piece of art. Playing it for the first time in 2020, I couldn't believe how well it's held up and just how beautiful it still is. On the surface, it looks like any other zombie shooter, but what I admire most about The Last of Us is that its primary focus is on the ways love endures in spite of impossible suffering. Henry and Sam, Bill and Frank, Joel and Ellie of course, the game is built on relationships. While society at large is fractured, untrusting, violent, and afraid, the personal connections we see remind us why we bother to survive at all. The reason the TV show is so excellent is because it understands this, and uses the medium to emphasize these connections. It would be disruptive, to say the least, to play as Bill or Frank in the game, but taking an episode to focus on these characters in the show feels entirely natural, and resulted in what might possibly be the best directed piece of film I've ever seen. It is a touching rendition of the love that still remains after the world has collapsed. And without love, survival is a chore, not a gift. Ultimately, throughout both games, there is very little love that gets to endure. Almost every character is left with devastating loss and emptiness in one way or another. The end of the world is still cruel, after all. But this doesn't make love any less worth having. It may not be permanent, but it's all that's left. Beyond the endurance of the human will and the strength of love, there is another theme that unifies all of these stories. The engineering of our own demise. We cannot help but invent ourselves to death. In almost every single story, our ruin is self-determined. In Fallout, our lust for power and the invention of the atom bomb has brought the end of civilization as we know it. And in Horizon Zero Dawn, rogue AI wiped out humanity. Our own scientific ambition has brought about zombies in countless stories, and self-induced global warming is responsible for the outbreak in The Last of Us. Almost universally, the end point of capitalism is drawn at total destruction. If war is already so profitable, manufacturing and selling the end of the world will surely print a fortune. Umbrella Corporation, Arasaka, vault Tech, Aperture Science, all of these evil fictional companies are only a small step away from the corporations that currently dominate our world. Boeing is hardly hiding the fact that they are killing whistleblowers, Amazon is encroaching on every aspect of domestic life, and Tesla is closer to a cult than a company. As we build our tower of achievement higher and higher, the fall only becomes more and more lethal. The end of the world in these stories is born from Reckless ambition and greed. For our real world, however, hate seems the more likely cause. Nuclear warfare in the Fallout games is almost comical, and truth be told, it is absurd. But the reality of nuclear weapons is nauseating. <laughs>
Harashi no Gen is a Japanese film about the horrific fallout of the atomic bombs used at the tail end of World War II, where Fallout employs satire to convey the ridiculous premise of surefire destruction, Harashi no Gen is real and raw. The film is visually disturbing in a way that is sickeningly real. By the time the bombs were dropped, World War II was essentially over. Germany had been defeated, the Japanese people were calling for the country's surrender, and victory was all but assured for the Allied powers. But Oppenheimer's bomb was already built. We are, as a species, always hungry. Hungry for achievement to prove ourselves. Rather than letting this bomb go to waste, the American government decided that we ought to demonstrate our power, our achievement. The nuclear bomb defined a new kind of suffering, a kind of horror that the world had never seen before. A ghastly mutilation of human life that is unfathomably grotesque. A mere two of these weapons, used at the end of a war already won, changed the world forever. This is a power that no man should wield. Knowing this, how many nuclear weapons do you think are in the world today? A handful? Maybe a dozen, just in case. Twelve thousand and one hundred nuclear warheads are currently in existence with Russia and the United States possessing 90% of those weapons. Two nations hold the end of the world in their fist. There is a glamour to rising from the ashes in post-apocalyptic stories, a valour to the human spirit, but if true, world-scale nuclear warfare breaks out, I suspect there will be no ashes to rise from. The end of the world that we write about is enticing. It's a chance to try again, to prove ourselves worthy of the blood in our veins and the life in our hearts. But we cannot help but invent ourselves to death, to total annihilation. We must prove ourselves so strong, so capable, so proficient in working the materials of this earth that when we devise our own death, it will be total, unstoppable. It will be the utmost of human accomplishment, complete and utter death. The true obliteration of not just our species, not just all species, but the complete destruction of our planet. A total holistic annihilation of everything we have ever known, loved, everything we have ever seen. And yet, we crave the end of the world. We crave the apocalypse.